Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Goblin Salvage Rights. I'm Robert. I'm Eric. And today is a New Year's special. 2023 is here. Well, it's to, almost here. It's very almost, close. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't hold your breath, but still, <laughs> hold your breath. Um, by the time you see this, it'll be 2023. And um, today's topic are our New Year's resolutions, the things we want to do better, the things we want to do worse, possibly, but mainly better. I am resolved to do both. I want to fail sideways as well. Can we throw that in there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. We can fail in whatever direction you want. Okay. Mostly up, some sideways, just for uh, variety. So uh, we haven't played a lot of games. We haven't. Uh, so instead, I want to talk about any Christmas gifts we got. Any? Did you get any cool, Christmas gifts? Did you get any cool holiday Christmas gifts? I didn't gifts? get any cool holiday gifts because we don't necessarily do that in my home. Okay. Uh, we're big on experiences, so we all kind of went out and ate, uh, you know, cool breakfasts, that sort of thing. But uh, rumor has it, a certain large, red, bearded guy showed up at your place and dropped a few books. Yes, yes. Actually, it was just my mom and my wife. Yeah, you can be honest. You mugged Santa before he got back up the chimney, and that's how you got those three books, right? That's the thing. No chimney means they have to slip under the door, and then that's when I get them. All right. So what uh, do you got there? So I, I, I ended up getting um, Secrets of Magic and... Um, Guns and Gears, two books that have been out for a while, but back I haven't, back. Had, yep. haven't had physical copies of yet, so that's really nice. But the creme de la creme, yeah, impossible land. This has been years in the waiting for some of us. I have, I am in love with impossible lands. Mm -hmm. I've both of my campaigns are set in impossible lands. Yep. The things I want to do in 2023 will likely be also set in the impossible lands. So and guns and uh, guns and gear. Secrets of Magic, it's all there. It's all there. It, this is honestly the absolutely perfect trifecta. It, it really is. Impossible Lance is kind of the weird mobile of nations, yes. uh, nation groupings in Galarian. I, I, I can't wait to see what you dig up. I'm actually going to avoid reading that book just so I can wait for you to bring it up in game. Okay, okay, that's, yeah. that's fucking awesome, actually. Yeah. I'm really stoked for that. So, um, yeah, I paid $60 for this thing, and I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> that's how much I like your game. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, that's pretty much it for me. I got some new dice. Uh, I got a sweet new um, figurine that a friend gave me. Uh, what do you call those? Is, that's not a mini. That's a figurine. A figurine. Yeah, okay. or a it's statue. not a bust. It's a, a statue, statuette. I don't know, something like that. Does it come alive at night? I hope so. Do you remember that, that, that movie from the 90s um, of the little an the 18 inch tall knight that ran around your living room at two o'clock in the morning. No, it was like a kid's movie and it had, it had a young kid and th there were like action figures. It was like the, it was like the American action figures versus like the monsters and the monsters and the action figures came alive, but the monsters were actually the good guys. And the kid and the monsters. And like G.I. Like, Joe were the bad guys? Yeah. And the kid I've and the I've never heard of this, and this sounds amazing. Yeah. I, I don't remember what it was called, but I fucking love yeah. that movie. If anybody remembers kid. this, write it down there. I need Comments. to know. Um, but yeah, so um, everyone knows I'm a huge Dark Souls fan, and uh, one, of my, one of my good friends just moved to Portland over the Christmas holiday. I helped Yay. them move, and they gave me one of their favorite statues. Uh, of Dark, that's a Dark Souls. That's the iconic Dark Souls 2 character. So pretty stoked. Well, Dude, let me know next time he's moving so I can help. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but Great yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much the the the. No, surprisingly enough, I didn't get any Warhammer stuff for Christmas. I think people know that I they don't want to reinforce my new habit. I think that's what it is. They don't. Yeah. They don't want to support. Yeah, Magic and Warhammer are things that I don't feel like uh, getting a third mortgage on. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. But yeah, so Christmas was good to me, especially for my creative habit. And Nicely I think done. today, when we talk about what we have on the menu, these mm -hmm. all these things will come together in a line. At least yeah. they will for me. Yeah. And by the way, don't forget to write your names in those because, you know, everybody at the table is going to have their own copy of these and they're all going to be stacked together. Every okay, Wednesday. so story time. Real quick, before we get started, I have a tradition I like to do with my books. So growing up, I started playing D and D when I was about ten years old, and I played at a local game store named um, the Dark Side Comics and Games in Sarasota, Florida. And my group was a bunch of like old people, not old people. I, I say old people. I'm right. You were I'm, like what sixteen at the time? I know, no, I was ten. I started playing D and D when I was ten. That's right. And everyone else I was playing with was like 
in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Oh, so old. I mean, my <laughs> my DM, Tim, Tim, uh, I, I won't, I won't, I won't say his last name uh-huh. on live on air. Right, because no but, one will make the connection. Yeah, I know, right? But anyway, he was like this, he was like this red box guy. He had this huge hillbilly beard. I remember he was missing this front tooth. He was absolutely the best DM for a 10 year old kid Mm -hmm. because he had the experience of playing D and D's entire life with the patience of a father who's already had kids that had gone out. Right. So I remember he would like hand me a toy sword and like a shield and to help me like remember about like, hold, like what do I have? What does my character have in his hands? That is totally cool. He would have a huge pile of all of his minis that he was about to do in front of, um, in front of the DM screen and I would just pick them up and like, look at the cool minis while it wasn't my turn and stuff sure. like that. They knew I was like ADHD out the wazoo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and we didn't um, have fidget spinners back then. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, what happened was, uh, there was another woman in the, in the, in the group. Her name was Jill and Jill wa- taught special needs children. And I think she picked up almost immediately that I was special needs. Um, and she, I remember there was this moment where she, 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 she picked, picked up my character sheet and she took out a red pen literally out of nowhere and started circling my character sheet and circling my character sheet. And I'm, I look over realizing now that my character sheet's been stolen. I'm like, Jill, what are you doing? She's like, Robert, honey, has anyone told you that you're dyslexic? And I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? Dyslexic? I'm not, dyslexic. what are you talking I'm not, my, my head's not broken. And <laughs> she's like, no, sweetie, I'm pretty sure you are. Can you uh, just write out a couple of words for me? So I'm like, yeah, of course. So I started writing out a, like a, a couple paragraphs that she was like, you know, saying, saying it to me. And she takes a look at it. And she's like, okay, now can you read this, this excerpt for me out loud? And uh-huh. I started reading it for her out loud and stuff like that. And she's like, yeah, honey, you really should go to a doctor and get, like diagnosed and you're 10 here. I'm like this. literally 10. See, this is the value of the role playing game as a hobby. You can save so much money on <laughs> therapy. Just go to your local FLGS, whatever it's yeah. called. And then I hope you get somebody who can diagnose you. Yeah, the exactly. Table. So long story to make this very long story shorter. Right. Um, I started writing, I can't exactly remember why, but I started writing Roberts, Robert O'Neill's not Jill's. In the front of my book. That's where that came from. I've seen that. And I've been doing that as kind of this personal- Like homage? Om- yeah. This personal homage to uh-huh. that moment. I'm probably oh, not that's gonna, cool. I'm probably not, never going to run into her again for the rest of my life unless I go back home and I, I meet her Are you kidding? She's one of our subscribers right now. Oh, God. I would hope so. Jill, if you're watching, please comment down. I will. Let's reconnect. And then we'll get you a plane ticket to come out to Portland, Oregon, so you can attend one of our games and tell all of us what's wrong with us. That would- Honestly, be fantastic. <laughs> that would that would make my year. I, I need to write that down as one of my uh, as one of my New Year's right. resolutions. Is, is this now a top eleven? New oh, Year's yeah. resolution. Top eleven. Top okay. eleven. So yeah, uh, that's well, the what backstory. are we here for? That, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so good stuff. we're here for New Year's resolutions. Um, what does that mean? Everybody says I'm going to go to the gym, and then we crap out a weekend. So what yeah. are we really talking about here? So I've made a list of all of the things that I want to accomplish. Or begin working on in 2023. Um, I'm a huge list guy. I'm a huge notes guy. I love writing things down. But more importantly, I love planning for the future. Mm -hmm. Because in my- You got a spreadsheet brain. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet brain. It's the only way I can stay organized. And my mind is just pure chaos. So I have to put that chaos out into the real world. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think goals are really important for all of us because they allow us to focus our energy. I feel like- I, at least, if not at most people, waste energy a lot of times by focusing on things that we never plan on seeing to the end. And then Welcome we to the lo- club. We've got jackets. <laughs> yeah. And then we let the things that we would have really wanted to accomplish stay by the wayside. Yeah. So by making a plan, at least for myself, mm-hmm. or at the beginning of the year, defining some general goals I want to accomplish. Sure. And then, and then ratcheting down and, and diving deeper and deeper and deeper and creating more and more yeah. um, uh, concrete action items for me to do. That's how I actually get things done. Yeah. People always wonder how I spin so many plates all the time. Mm -hmm. For those of you wondering out there, I have like a whole career doing, uh, you have too many things on your plates. Yeah. I I make film outside of this podcast. This is literally just like a side hustle. I don't get paid for. Um, but 
I, I make right. Like, you're doing this. You're running games. You're right. hanging out with your lovely girlfriend. I, you're hanging out with us mooks on exactly Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and um, every other days. But yeah, so I, I love spreadsheets and lists. But more importantly, I think it's really important at the beginning of every year. Actually, I do it at the beginning of every quarter mm-hmm. to kind of define the things I want to get done in the remaining time. Sure. So. I and you, I mean, yours has bullet points and everything. I just fancy scratch some stuff down on the list. So today we're going to talk about uh, what we want to get done, what we want to see happen in 2023. For me, it's more of just saying these things out loud Mm -hmm. help me to reassess what is truly important to me. Absolutely. So when I first put together this uh, top 10, you know, New Year's resolutions list, I, I... Try to figure out, you know, what, why, why do I care? I, I know I'm going to break all of my resolutions three weeks into January because okay. that's, you know, that's kind of how it works. But um, at least by saying these things out loud, we get to shape the, uh, our understanding of the things that we think are important to us. And then we let them percolate a little, a little bit and some of them fall away and others take their place. So that, that was the, uh, the beauty of this exercise for me. Whether or not I get these 10 things done in the next 12 months is less important to me than this is actually the shape of the year to come that I would love to see. So I'm going to strive for some and fail on others. And if I hit one of these, I'll be happy. All right. So, and that just shows the divergence in our uh, ability in our, in our understanding and the way we act in the universe. I love that. You've got spreadsheet brain. I've got DOS brain. DOS brain. (laughs) Okay, cool, cool, cool. Hang on. I'm going to have a glass of water. here. Sweet. Um, (laughs) um, (laughs) Cheers. Slauncha. Apparently, Eric loves my rock climbing mug. It's an amazing mug. It's got the little rock climbing thing instead of the hand handle. What do you call it? It's just like a hold. The gripper thingy? Yeah, it's like a rock climbing hold. There's not like a, a special name for it no, you guys use when you're in your rock climbing parties? Yeah, they're called holds. The they're holds, okay. They're just holds. They're things you hold. Well, uh, sweet hold, man. Yeah, thanks, bro. I've got mine broken down into two categories. I've got resolutions that I want to uh, see come to fruition as a GM. Mm-hmm. I think it would be cool to have all of these met for various reasons I'll get into. And the second half of my list is um, New Year's resolutions I have as a gamer and things I want to see that, that make the gaming landscape better, more enjoyable as a player. And these are things that I want for my own enjoyment, but I think by doing these, I'll be able to help other people around the table uh, enjoy the experience as well. Uh, how did you make your list? Did you just grab 10 random things out of the air or were you kind of thinking in a particular direction? Um, most of my action items revolve around DMing and the podcast. Um, sure. so I probably should have done one or two about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my top 12 resolutions. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean like the podcast takes over a lot of my brain yeah. and my headspace. So, Rightly so, um, so yeah, a lot of my action items, but because my game and the podcast are so closely intertwined in my mind, mm-hmm. um, they kind of bounce off each other. The first one I want to talk up, talk about is uh, Dungeon Twenty Three. Yeah, this thing that's taking over. A you lot just did of a video it. on that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, so it's, there's this thing that's taking over the TTRPG space called Dungeon Twenty Three. You basically make a mega dungeon that's twelve levels deep, one level for every month, and you make a, a room in the dungeon every day. I've seen a lot of people online talk about the merits of how good is a dungeon going to be if you make it in this way. And, you know, maybe a dun- mega dungeon shouldn't be that long, blah, 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 blah. And I think those people, I understand where they're coming from, but they're missing the point. The point is to give you the opportunity and the framework to work on a thing every day. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's creating a framework for you to sit down and practice the craft, creating, of creating a habit. world, creating a habit. Yeah. Exactly. Um, because habits are what change people, not new year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. So Tony Robbins about to bust through that door any moment. No, but I do have a copy of atomic habits in the other room. (laughs) I know you do. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a self-help junkie, unfortunately. Anyway. Um, so yeah, dungeon 23, uh, I haven't really decided what I'm going to do for my dungeon 23. I don't Uh know where I'm going to put it. I don't know uh, how. Uh, I'm going to set it up, but there is a very high chance that my Dungeon 23 will take place in the Impossible Lands. Uh, every circle of your Venn diagram involves the Impossible Lands. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Once I've run a game in every single country, two or three times over, mm-hmm. I might be done with the setting yeah. and move to a different country. But- so uh, on, on that note, you were just talking about um, Dungeon 23 thing. Uh, I did start today, actually, after your text earlier, and I think I decided that I want mine to be a dungeon 
that involves player characters that all have the ability to fly. Like from the get go. Okay. So what does a dungeon look like if everybody has wings or the ability to fly or whatever? Um, I, that, that's as far as I thought about it. Okay. I remember there was a very old D&D dungeon, w- which was actually a city created by beholders. Not a lot of Nikes or Reeboks or Adidas floating around that city. So they, uh, their, their boulevards are vertical I love and, it. Uh, and stuff like that. So like, what, what would a dungeon look like if everybody was in the cast of, uh, uh, what was that animated owl movie that was so awesome? I, we're th- the we're Battle sp- of Goa'ul or whatever it was we're called. We're spitting sick fucking references today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god! And we haven't gotten to our our, our first one here yet. So um, that's, that's kind of that's that's what I'm thinking for the dungeon twenty three. I want to do like a flight based dungeon, not one particular trap that involves flight based creatures, mm-hmm. but like the whole thing. What would that look like? That's fucking awesome. I yeah. love that idea. So that's we'll the kind of out of the box stuff that I that I think this is perfect for. That kind yeah. of inspiration, you know. Yeah. Create it, create this odd premise and mm-hmm. then build everything around that odd premise and see yeah. where it takes you. And it's day to day, super low hanging fruit. So I don't have to feel intimidated by it. Exactly. Which makes me quit three weeks into January. Absolutely. So uh, we may or may not publish mm-hmm. our Dungeon 23s at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. I kind of want to, or at least have the body or maybe have like, maybe in 2024, we'll write an adventure path mm-hmm. surrounding designer's diary. Dungeon 23. Yeah. Our Dungeon 23 we made it last year. Yeah. Who knows? We'll, 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 we'll take that off, off camera and, uh, and talk about that. I kind of, I kind of like that idea a lot. Um, so yeah, where does that leave us? What's your next, uh, what's your next resolution? So, um, I may or may not have mentioned that I'm running a game currently called mm. Agents of Edgewatt. Yes, you And are. it's very cops and robbers, uh, and, uh, with all the baggage. I, um, uh, I'm, I'm a visual kinesthetic learner. And so I just assume that the other 7 billion people on the planet are too. That's how I make sense of the world around me. And uh, what that means in the gaming context is I like to, I like to look at things. I like artwork. I like to touch things. I like miniatures. I, I need to interact with things in a kinesthetic manner uh, and visual. Otherwise, it'll be, uh, you know, in one ear and out the other. So when people, like, read to me a rule or something out of, art, uh, out of Nethys, I, I just, here, let me see that. And then I read it, and all of a sudden I grok it. So in that spirit, I want to create more in-world artifacts in my game. So I started with a, um, a series of newspaper articles that were intended to um, summarize the recent events of the last few sessions. And uh, these things are called Eyes on Absalom. That's the name of the Victorian rag that I'm putting together. It's, it's in the modules. And I've done three of them so far. And they were really cool, like, a, uh, you know, from my view, like a, like a 30,000 foot in the air view of what's going on. Uh, no, no details, anything like that. Just sort of like a the first few sentences, maybe a paragraph in the article, and then it drops and the article presumes to go on. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody else knows what's in that article. And it's just sort of like a summary snapshots with artwork from the actual module I've been able to get off the internet. And uh, just something I can hand you guys and say, here, look, read it. You are your character in the city reading the newspaper right now. And you have this in your hand. I, I think that would help. That does help me as a player. Uh, and as a GM to close the gap between a schlub sitting in a chair rolling dice and the actual character in the actual cobble streets with an actual eyes of Absalom in his hand. So I want in-game artifacts here on the table and then uh, give them out as gifts and prizes and shit throughout the year. That's uh, awesome. That's, that's, I'm going to do that in some way, shape or form. I've got 12 months to figure it out and it's going to start with that newspaper. That takes a lot of work. The first one did. The second one took less time. The third one took almost no time at all. Okay. Once I figured out how to get what I needed. And it's not like I had to dig too deep into the, uh, into the pros. Um, you know, last week uh, it was reported that somebody was found smashing the window with the Kobold antique store. Yeah. Um, if you use that, if you use that voice while you're writing too, <laughs> it probably helps you a lot. You know what I mean? Like I, I find that when I'm writing, especially writing for a character, if I, I speak out, I actually voice to text. Sure. I dictate a lot of my stuff. Yeah, super useful. And um, I normally use voices or characters and it kind of puts you in the mood and it mm-hmm. makes it easier for you to. It closes that gap. Yeah, exactly. You know, I want to stop being air for a moment and start being troglodyte the Magnificent. Is that I a good name? I love that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's mine. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What do you, what do you got? Um, next one on my list is make a detailed roadmap for fantasy Zoids. Now, a little bit of context. Sounds fantasy ambitious. Zoids 
is my nickname for the campaign I'm running right our now. Our Wednesday campaign? Our Wednesday game. Fantasy Zoids, it's basically just like in the anime Zoids. They go around the world looking for ancient artifact Zoids that help them, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's kind of what you guys are doing now. So that's what I named it in our Discord and stuff like that. Um, but I've been really flying by the seat of my pants for the past four levels. And it's beginning to become painfully obvious. And honestly, I also just need some direction for myself so that I can prep more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to do is sit down and write out the next, what I think the next five or six levels are going to look like. Maybe also write out two or three major arcs that I want the story to have in theme Okay, and gotcha. I see what you're getting at. So yep. I want to make like a roadmap for the game. Mm -hmm. And then I can begin filling in underneath that roadmap or underneath those arcs. That's fun. Plotting a, happen. a game arc is just, yeah. it's super exciting for me, you know, because I like to write. I love the structure of writing and how to put all those ideas together so that your structure remains sound over a long-term storytelling. And that's not easy in the slightest. So I'm excited to see what you come up with. Yeah, it's not easy. And I'm also really new to story writing mm -hmm. and I'm new to DMing. Honestly, I don't DM that much. I've been a kind of a, a, a consummate player my entire life. So this is a lot of new uncharted territory for me. And I think the reason I've been so resistant to DMing is because I, I never really found the things that I like in DMing and mm -hmm. latched onto them. And I never really had a plan for my DMing experience because a lot of DMing is done outside of the game. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fun part of the game is being in the game. So, sure. um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to have a good time planning it out and it's probably going to be pretty bad, but the it always is. At first. It's exactly. always bad until it's not exactly. And, uh, I think the trick at the end of the day is to not choke the life out of it in mm -hmm. pursuit of the project. Absolutely. So when it stops being fun, it's okay to put it down and walk away from the table for however long you need. It'll be there when you come back. And uh, that's, you know, I've, I've got perfectionist tendencies, which is why I never get anything done. Um, and I, I had to learn how to just choke that out of my system. And it's, it's, it's a hard, ongoing struggle. So, yeah, keep me posted on that. How do you feel about widescreen battle mats? widescreen yeah like a 48 inch tv horizontal on the table with a case a wooden case built around oh, it oh you, you can carry around like a suitcase uh, from a uh, game to game you mean the you mean the tv that, i want my i i want my tv that Jacques let us have painted yeah between jock and ben and okay. probably everybody else we've got such a talented crew around us everybody knows how to do everything it seems um just get us all in the same room and like pump this thing out in a day or two but yeah i um you know most of us grew up with battle mats and yeah, these, totally. you know, we take our, our, our black markers and ham fistedly draw these dungeons out. And that's kind of how we make our dungeons. Okay. That's fine. That's great. But there's so much good artwork now and there's flip mats and there's battle mats and there's, uh, there, there's just all this wonderful battle cartography out there with actual art on them. And you can see the buildings on the inside and, uh, some of it's 3d and I, I want that shit on my table. I think yeah. there's so much good stuff now that I feel irresponsible not finding a way for it to get to the table. So I want to build one and I want to have that be a regular part of combats going forward. Maybe not like every single combat needs that, but certainly the boss fights and the locations that are just gorgeous. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's my second one. I want to create a widescreen battle mat that I can transport from house to house. So it's not a... The transport is going to be the hard part. It is, yeah. And I, I've seen people put these together on the YouTubes and they basically look like suitcases, mm -hmm. like old timey suitcases when you're out there selling vacuums in the dust bowl yeah. and you got this, uh, this big old battle mat at your side. Yeah. Like a, a, a coffee table DM, like a D&D &D coffee table with a screen in it wouldn't be as hard to make as a, a portable version of it. Yeah, you know the, the trick mean? is to find a way for the heat to escape and uh, getting the ventilation right. Gotcha. It's what's going to keep everything going wonky. Otherwise, you'll have problems that range from like your your miniatures literally melt on the screen because they're plastic. Oh shit! Um, I didn't even think to of that. a bunch of other stuff. You know, just Fuck. too much heat, not enough release. So uh, you know, th th there's a bunch of uh, laws of thermodynamics involved with this that I don't know yet, but uh, I know people who do. 
That's true. So some of you guys are going to help me out this year with my uh, my number two resolution. Sweet. That sounds... Would that, that be number eight? My number awesome. eight resolution. So next up on my list is uh, very actually pretty related to yours is paint and integrate minis and props for my D&D games. Yep, please do, because you're getting really good at it, and I want to see it on the table. I appreciate it. Yeah, I've I, uh, been painting a lot more than usual, and I'm starting to get kind of decent at, at making consistently uh, not terrible uh, minis. You should put so, that on your business card, consistently <laughs> not terrible. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I want to do a lot more painting for D&D, because the majority of my painting, the vast majority of my paintings for, for Warhammer, mm-hmm. And I finally have basically like 2,000 points of Necrons painted, and I just started on painting orcs for my Age of Sigmar army. Mm -hmm. So I think in between all of that, I can just knock out a couple characters for uh, our games at least. I mean, I have some for our Edgewatch game. Next on the table is my game with Oliver and Aspen and Mm -hmm. Natalie. That's Abomination Vaults, right? Abomination Vaults, yeah. Luckily, I haven't painted anything yet because Natalie just swapped out their character. But it, don't you it, hate it when people do that in the middle uh, of your game? No. Don't you hate it when they do that five times in the middle of your game? No. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm basically going to be painting the minis for those games, hopefully. Cool. And I really actually enjoy that Abomination Vaults game. Yeah. It's very slow because we only play every other week. I've seen the mat that Oliver made up for that. That is a so gorgeous badass. piece of artwork. Yeah. Oh, my God. I haven't basically, even seen it in person. Yeah. Basically, Oliver printed out the entire mat so that the squares on the mat are five by five. And then he glued them to cardboard mm-hmm. and cut them out. Yeah. So he puts them in like little jigsaw puzzles. Yep. It's pretty fucking rad. Yeah. Makes me think of those playgrounds we had when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to make D- I want to make minis for them. I want to make minis for our Wednesday game, and then after I'm done with that, after everyone has minis for their characters, from there I want to begin making stuff for the actual table. So like you have the the digital mat, mm-hmm. I want to make like props, like yeah. paint monsters or paint. Oh God, you and Gabby need to get tiles. your heads together for that one because yeah, that's her territory too. Fucking rad. And yeah. I have this 3D printer mm-hmm. that I got gifted like a year or two ago mm-hmm. that's just been sitting unused and unloved because 3d printing is hard and I don't need another hobby, but, um, I really actually want to use it to make some of the stuff because between the 3d printer and like, there's this YouTube channel called black magic craft, um, who makes uh, a lot of like, they make a lot of stuff for wargaming, content for wargaming mm-hmm. for like, uh, we're talking about terrain, right? Terrain pieces. Yeah. For, but he also does a, a whole bunch of, stuff for um D D games. Like he actually I think his channel kind of got started by making stuff for D D games. Sure. So I want to get I want to like dive into his channel a little bit more and maybe start really making custom pieces for my D D games See, to kind of bring a little bit of life into the Yeah, no, that's really cool. I uh I've got a dog, as you know. I love my dog more than just about anything in the world. And I keep going to uh these uh pet stores to find goofy little toys and whatnot for and I keep going by the fish department yeah. and they've got all the terrarium pieces. They used to look so jank and now they look amazing. Every single one of them. And yeah. they're all like $50 or more a piece. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck. But so yeah, having a 3d printer to kind of replicate some of that, yeah. the, the new uh, FDL stuff that's been coming around lately. I, uh, I, I want to see that on the table. So I'm glad you put that on your list. I'm gonna hold you to it. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so, let's see. I, um, I started using music. And uh, doing cold opens uh, for my games. And what I've been trying to do is take a particular song that I like, and I think it speaks to the uh, the look and theme and mood of, of the session we're about to get into. And it speaks specifically to one of the player characters' uh, current um, tension, their, their unresolved struggle in one very specific area. And uh, I, I, I really like it. It was sort of just a thing I did to kind of try to be a little different from every other game I've ever done. But now I, I like it so much and I think, I think it just works. I want to start n- zeroing in on my song choices so that there's actual clues within the lyrical content that you can mine to unlock parts of the adventure at the table. And if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But if you do, I want to have a little Easter eggs for the players that 
go through the trouble to do that because that does a couple of things. One that says, oh, this is different. This is a different gaminess from our usual gaminess. But the other thing is if, if I have a song that's about your character, Robert, and then, uh, you know, Tyler and Nick and Ben and Jacques and uh, everyone else, they all sort of read the lyrics. They're learning more about your character and your character's struggle. And that's something that I've always felt was missing from games. You know, we even talked about this in another video before. Can you tell me anything about anybody else's character around the table? Mm -hmm. Above and beyond, they like to slap things with a stick. And the answer is usually no. But uh, th this is furthering that end for me. So one of my resolutions is I want to get super deliberate about my song choices and then create um, actual rewards for people who bother to go deep. That's and, cool. And explore that part of the game. Totally. So. Yeah, the, my only note would be to make the songs available on Discord to listen to afterwards. Yeah, I've start, I put the, the lyrics up. Um, yeah, Tyler, Tyler's been putting the lyrics up. She's mm -hmm. been doing an amazing job about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the actual songs, I just, if you think that's valuable, I can start doing it. Um, I have basic Discord and it doesn't like me to do sound things. Oh, no, I, I just mean like, you know, you could find, most songs are on YouTube these days. So mm -hmm. you could just like, after the game is done or before sure. the game's done, just post yeah. a link to it on YouTube. Because yeah, a lot of times... Can... I feel kind of awkward just sitting there all while we all communally listen to this song that's being played and like trying to take it all in. And I, f I look around and everyone else is like, what does this mean? That's funny because every time I, I like walk around the house whenever this is going yeah. on and whenever I walk by the kitchen where you mm -hmm. guys are, I hear you guys all talking. Yeah, and exactly. I, I, I just assume nobody's listening to the music at all. So that's what I'm saying. Like if it's, we're either talking or they're all just like heads down trying to like take it in. Yeah. And I, so I clearly got to dial this in, but I think, I think when we do, it could, it could be a very different kind of gaming experience absolutely. that I've never had. And I want to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would just like to listen to the song again. Yeah. After the fact, maybe when I'm at home to kind of digest. Tyler and I that. can work on a uh, like these are all the the cold opens that we've uh, done to present, mm -hmm. and um, and I don't know if you noticed or not, but like next to the actual song title and the lyrics, um, we put the uh, the character that song is speaking to. So oftentimes it's a PC, sometimes it's a non-player character. It's a uh, the lyrics explaining what's going on with that NPC, the BBEG in the story, and uh, and stuff that you're not privy to, but is still going on in the universe. So uh, I, I like that kind of stuff. It helps to kind of like the story around the story is interesting for me in uh, D&D games. Uh, Love so it. Yeah. Love it. So next up on my list is uh, I want to listen to some fantasy novels in order to make like better audiobooks? stories. Yeah. So I am a, I, I'm a nonfiction kind of mm -hmm. guy. That's pretty yep. much all I listen to 24 seven. And um, I mean, I, I don't really have, I kind of give myself like one or two fantasy or not or fiction books a, a year mm -hmm. to listen to. But I think I need to start getting some serious recommendations and really tighten my belt and um, begin listening to uh, audiobooks for fantasy novels. Because one of the things I'm really lacking is a, a, I'm a fake nerd is basically what it is. <laughs> I'm just a fake nerd. I don't like people reference all these cool fantasy things all the time. And I'm like, yeah, totally. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I want to be able to actually like interact with some of this pop culture or fiction, you know, like not the novel culture mm -hmm. that's out there. And I think it'll really, really help me enhance my own D and D game and my own yeah. storytelling ability by listening to other stories. Are you familiar with Sturgeon's law? No. 95% of everything is trash. 95% of everything is trash. Write yeah. That down. So like 95% of all the fantasy books that you could probably listen to are probably not worth listening to. Got it. And this is a gross oversimplification. Obviously. But what I'm getting at is uh, maybe find the people who uh, you either want to learn more about because their choices reflect them as people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, just find people who know about fantasy and what quality fantasy is. I mean, I've gotten and then, uh, really, just get like one from each of them and put it on a to-do list. Yeah. I've gotten really good uh, recommendations in the past from Oliver and Aspen and you. Yeah. And yeah. You Gabby. got some good people on that list. So I think I'm going to do just that and just take a couple off the list and mm -hmm. then start throwing them on my, uh, on my phone to listen yeah. to when I'm like running and stuff like that. Some of these books that are, uh, they're novels and you listen to them. Um, they're actually, uh, uh, what's the word? voice actors get in there mm -hmm. and it's, it's actually like a stage production basically. And wow. so you can, you can further separate what's going on if your brain has trouble with that sort of thing. 
and you can tell what's going on and where it's going and who it's coming from and that sort of thing. It's just easier to parse a story sometimes when uh, when it's acted out by different uh, voices, like literal voices. Gotcha. So that, that's something that helped me at some point, especially with like Lord of the Rings type stuff where you have a large cast of primary characters. Wait, who said what? This person thinks like how? Why do I care about X? Uh, it's just easier when you have a cast. Oh. I dig it. I like it. I'm always up for people reading more, listening to more and absorbing more because, uh, you know, it keeps the roofs over writers' heads. I want to create a plot arc for every player character uh, in, my, uh, in my AP that I'm currently doing. What I mean by that is it's a six-book AP, and there are five players. Everybody gets an entire book where that book is about you and your friends. So the first one we just did, Devil with the Dreaming Palace, which had the H.H. H. Holmes uh, murder hotel. And uh, all the shenanigans leading up to that, serial killers, hotel, missing people reports, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was all, that was Jacques' book. That was Elmo Barley Bramble. Yeah, totally. And with the emphasis on his uncle and the surprise, hopefully, the twist of the serial killer being the uncle, blah, blah, blah. Um, totally surprised to all of us, by the way. Uh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Hopefully in a good way. And not in a bad way. We were all just like... I, I, I thought I had like tipped my cards like six months before that. Nah. But, uh, but a couple of you were like, really? And I'm like... What do you mean, really? You, knew that, you already knew this. No, we didn't. Oh, yay, go me. Yeah, but uh, but that w- what I did there with Jacques, um, um, halfling detective family guy character. Uh, you probably noticed by now, like every other session had a really big, um, deep dive into his family situation, into his uh ex girlfriend situation, the woman he was supposed to marry all those years ago. This is big plot stuff that's gonna matter for uh, Agents of Edgewatch going forward. But I needed the whole book to tell it. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't monkey it up with your shitty character's background <laughs> and her shitty character's background and their shitty yeah. character's background. Yeah. I, I wanted to focus. So book two, and I'm not going to tell you who it is, but it's going to be another player and their character. And all the uh, everything is about Elmo is going to shift. And that's going to inform uh, the B plot and the, and the A plot. Mm-hmm. Um, I call all these character plots uh, C plots. And uh, the C informs the B, the B informs the A, and the A is the big mega plot with the BBEG at the end, like all Pathfinder APs are. So uh, again, just to boil it down, I want to create uh, a sophisticated, um, interesting, complex, without being complicated, mm. plot that lets each individual player be the star of one of the AP volumes. That's like four chapters of being the star. And you get your story told, and you get to tell your story. And you get to have some of your story revealed by the GM who's been holding out on you. And it's a, I, I want this symbiotic creation process between GM and player uh, for the space of four chapters. And that's, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't think about this before. I mean, these APs have been around for decades at this point, but I'm, I'm doing this for everything I do going forward. I really love that idea. I don't, the execution seems obviously difficult. But yeah, it is. And I foobarred a lot in the first book. Well, I mean, you know, you get every, it's the first time for everything. Yeah. But also like that, that approach takes a very specific kind of group. Mm -hmm. Like you can't get away with that in most groups, I want to say, but I definitely think you have a chance of pulling it off in ours. I think if I can sell it, I can do it. And that, that's the same thing with everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I I just got to figure out how to push everybody's buttons in a way that makes them respond the way I'm trying to get them to respond. And then the dopamine hits keep yeah. coming after that. And assuming all of our players don't watch the podcast, which I know you don't, except for you, Tyler. Especially you, Tyler. Um, we really, in, I think you should really tell them that that's kind of your plan up front. Uh-huh. And not obviously give away who's like a was. session zero kind of thing. Yeah. We kind of come back together yeah. on the seventh, mm-hmm. which is when we're playing our next game. Right. What's the date today? Today's the 28th. You have a week. I am so fucked. Yep. No, I can't wait. you got a week. No, you have two weeks. I have two weeks. Je- well, a week and a half. All right. Well, I'm going to so have to duck this- out of here early because I got some planning <laughs> yeah. to do. Yeah. Not this weekend, but the following weekend, we're playing our first game of Edgewash okay. after our break. That's enough time. I'll yeah. be ready. Totally. Um, find an AP that inspires me and convert it to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Okay. If you haven't found it yet. Yeah. Does it exist? Yes. Because I know you've looked at all the APs. No, I haven't. I really, I mean, so here's my thing. 
when I say an AP, I don't just mean, I don't just mean Pathfinder APs. Sure. I'm talking any adventure that exists mm-hmm. out there. I want to find any one. long form adventure. Yeah. Long form adventure from levels one to takes about a year, year and a half to run. Yes. So I want to find a big AP that I'm really jazzed on. And hopefully, actually, it's not made for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I would like to convert it Mm -hmm. as I read it because that'll allow me to practice balancing uh, for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And yep. it would this give makes me sense now. Yep. a little bit of a project to kind mm-hmm. of give to the world. Right. Because, I mean, obviously I'm not going to like sell someone else's published material. Sure. But. It'll help you create your own. It'll help me create my own. I would love to find an AP that I really love. Maybe I could reach out to the author and be like, hey, I want to convert your thing to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can get their blessing. And at the end, we can have it republished. But even if we, even if that's not in the cards, I would still love to just do it for myself. And then give it to the world for free. Like maybe we can make a video on it probably and just be like, Hey, I've been working on this project. I've been re reclass. I mean, I've been redoing this entire AP for Pathfinder Mm -hmm. second edition. Please enjoy if you want to run it. Um, because yeah, it'll really help me practice the conversion and the balancing things while also giving myself a whole springboard to run an AP because by the time you're done converting an AP, you you'll know it like back of your hand and you I can would hope run so. it without any problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those, uh, uh, what do you call those artists out there, performance artists where they do like pop songs in the style of punk Yeah. or, you know, this style, this song in the style of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you almost have to do that if you're converting from a non pathfinder to a pathfinder, like, I don't know if there's a Harry Potter role-playing game out there. Uh, what would that look like if it was done in the spirit of pathfinder? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, they they have wands to do all their magic. What if you take the wands away? It's not like everybody has cantrips left. But yeah, in Pathfinder, they do. It's not just the. It's not just the. So it's like a reimagining. Yeah, it's it's not just the the rules, the hard rules themselves. Mm-hmm. It's the spirit of Pathfinder. It's the the. I, I don't necessarily want to tie it directly to Galorian. Mm-hmm. If I can, I would love. I mean, Galorian's such a kitchen sink setting that I can probably find any AP and find a country that's applicable for it. Mm-hmm. But if I can't. I would still want to couch it in the some of the I don't know tenets of Pathfinder, some of the cultural um, norms that Pathfinder has kind of set for us as players. You know, everyone I think out there is knowing knows what I'm talking about. Like you know, like inclusion and uh, like access and stuff like that. You sure. know what I mean? Like the, the, to me, those are major building blocks of what well, pa- makes Pathfinder so freaking mm-hmm. rad. I mean, yeah, there, there's elements of hero worship of trans- transgendered individuals in lore. Yeah. And that's exactly. uh, stuff like that. Yeah. And not just, you know, not just trans people. I'm talking about everyone, you know, right. like the Mwangi books, you know, the list goes on. I was reading, uh, I, I, I didn't realize it. I mean, I knew about it, but I didn't realize how, like, it, how big um, the support in Guns and Gears was for disabled people, like people who are missing limbs and stuff like that. The message and like boards were all a about aids. that. Yeah. That's so fucking cool. The hearing cool. aids cracked me up for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both ears, my man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I saw that entry, I just, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I really want to find an AP that really sparks joy. Sure. in me and convert it for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Cool. As like a love letter. Well, to I will be second. on the lookout to see if I can help. So I'll, I'll be your, your AP wingman. Heck yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right, moving on. Um, Obsidian Portal. Have you heard of it? Unfortunately. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I say, I, that, I, wanna, I say that in jest. I say yeah, that in jest. I love Obsidian Portal and I love it for a bunch <laughs> of reasons I'm not going to go into now, but what I want to use it for, I want to I wanna leverage it as a tool in this case. I want to create a more sandboxy, to a degree, experience in my Wednesday game. Not not a full sandbox experience. Wednesday game? Are uh, you talking about it for Edgewatch? What did I say Wednesday? Edgewatch. Yeah. For Edgewatch. Yeah. Um, it's the only game you're running right now. Yeah. So I'm I'm not holding out on okay. you. That's the only <laughs> game I'm running right now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't keep secrets here. Uh, but yeah, the the idea of using Obsidian Portal to sort of um create a wiki of many different locations within the different districts, which are within the, uh, you know, the different uh, neighborhoods within districts within the city, and then the outer city, and then the undercity, 
and then the aquatic parts of the city, you know, just offshore. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of them have like these uh, really cool um, detail laden descriptions that is just plain info dumping if I do it at the table. So having Obsidian Portal be a wiki of different options for you guys to go to. You guys are sitting here thinking, what are we going to do for the next adventuring week? We got to follow these three leads and we, wait, where, where can we go look for clues? And you can go over to the Obsidian Portal and look at the wiki for the different neighborhoods and you see that there's like a, a, a carnival that's been, uh, you know, decrepit and dead for 10 years or so and there's undead all over the place. And you guys say, I, I want to go there. I'm, I'm going to steer this investigation over into that area of the city. And then I'll be able to, the week before that, once I get that information from you, I can spend the next week redesigning my encounters in that carnival. So kind of like a choose your own adventure, but with locations, um, using Obsidian Portal is sort of the, uh, the repository of knowledge for all of it. And then if you guys want to partake in that, you say, hey, these are my votes. This is where I want to go for this part of the investigation. And if you don't, don't. I know at least one of you is going to do it, and that person is going to determine the rest of the campaign Tyler. for the next year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so true. I'd I'd like to do that because um, even after this campaign's done, it still yeah. exists. It's there. I can use it for future games. So this reminds me of a shower thought I had uh, a few weeks ago that I wrote down in my notes app mm -hmm. that just popped back into the front of my mind. I'm not going to give you the full pitch here because this is some this is an idea that I think has a lot of potential. More than likely. This already exists, and I'm just reinventing the wheel. Okay. Should I be sitting down for this? But imagine an adventure path that was completely digital, that used all of the abilities that a digital medium affords you. Mm -hmm. Hyperlinks, whole nine yards, uh, monsters who you can click on, and it just pulls up a stat sheet right there for you in front of you. I would love to write an adventure path that was des not designed to be printed in a book, but that was specifically designed to be in some sort of online or digital medium. Mm -hmm. And this kind of sounds like what you're approaching because what you could do is you could generalize a lot of your locations and stuff like that, recontextualize it for mm -hmm. a general audience and then give it or sell it to someone who wants to run this game as a supplement. Like, sure. Hey, I want to run edge watch. Well, if you want to run edge watch, here is this entire generalized, um, what's the name of the website? Uh, Obsidian Portal. Yeah. So here's like this entire generalized wiki Obsidian Portal that I've made for this adventure path that you can buy for like 10 bucks mm -hmm. and it'll help you. You can download it and then install it to your Obsidian Portal or something. And then all of a sudden you can just begin sending your PCs these like wiki pages that it's already made for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I would love to make something like that. I wonder like that combined adventure. with the, uh, the new AI stuff I've been hearing about lately. Oh God. Yeah. yeah. That would be nuts. This is a weird era for design space now yeah, with the technologies absolutely. coming out at the rate they're coming out. And oh my God. I just I, imagine ask chat GDP or what, what is GTP? Chat I GDP. It'll probably be chat GDP <laughs> uh, soon enough. But uh, ask this program to just write an adventure path and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. That'd be nuts. I'm, I'm sure somebody's done that. Yeah, probably. I like it. I like it. Um, I am done with my GM resolutions. I'm ready oh. to move on to player resolutions. Shit. All right. Well, yeah. my next one. I got needs as a player. So My next one years. is to finish Zoids, my, my, our Wednesday game. Mm -hmm. I want to finish it by the end of the year. Okay. Like, have the, like I want to have it completed. So we'll have like 26 sessions between here and there or something like that? 26? There's 52 weeks in the year. I be, yeah. And I'm, I'm giving you some uh, cancellation <laughs> dates. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> No, I mean, like, I actually went back and did a quick tally of all the times we actually played, just mm -hmm. based off our Discord messages, and we play almost every Wednesday without We have fail. played more in this uh, campaign of yours than I've ever experienced in any of your other campaigns. The, 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 okay, thank the, you, but I meant generally on Wednesdays, like our attendance rating, not yeah. so much like- We're, we're good. I'm yeah, happy. Yeah, That's yeah, a compliment, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I love it. The, I've been trying to figure out a, a thing to say, a maxim in my head lately, that- um. If you are running a game or playing in a game and everybody is still showing up the next week, that's a good game. That's true. It's, it's not a bad, it's not a mediocre game. It's a good game because it's cementing attendance. I don't care what the reasons are for the attendance. It's a good game. And that's a great emotional baseline to work from as you try to figure ways to, you know, scale upward in your experience. So uh, I think you're running a great game on Wednesdays. Thanks. And I, I have now been told that 
the axe is going to drop in 12 months. And that part makes me a little sad. But, um, well, by then I'll have finished my dungeon 23 and I'll have finished converting. Are we going to have a 20th level path. super dungeon at the end of this mess? Maybe. Yeah. May- no, probably not for the same game, but, okay. um, maybe for related characters, you could always spin up a side character as a new PC and then have fun at it. Yeah. You know, what my next character is going to be, uh, coming soon. Stay tuned. I want to keep interactive session notes as a journal. There's nothing original about this. This is an old idea. Um, uh, the interactive part might be new, but I want to, I, I hate, hate, hate how the first chunk of every gaming session going all the way back to when I started it as a 15 year old kid, it seems to be, what did we do last week? I don't remember. And I know as a GM that that hits me right in the feels when I, when I hear that, like all, all the energy that you as a GM spend crafting these really cool stories and detailed personalities and all the plot stuff and the ahas and, you know, the fun moments. And seven days later, people were like, that didn't happen. Mm, Prove yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely. Just, it's frustrating. Like, wh- what did we do? Were you guys even having fun last week? And, and I'm one of the biggest offenders because I don't write these things down. Um, even though been, that was my job in the beginning. There have been many things that happen in our Wednesday game, in my Wednesday game, uh-huh. where you've been like, wait, that's not what happened. And then Gabby's like, no, Rob, that's totally what happened. That's my <laughs> Gabby voice now. And then that's exactly like, what Gabby Shit. sounds like. Yeah. So yeah. that um, I, I want better notes. And yeah. one of the things I mean by that is I want uh, pictures. I want visuals. Mm-hmm. I want to go on the internet. And like if we go through the elemental plane of Earth through a, uh, you know, windy pathway, uh, I want to find, you know, a corresponding picture I can doctor up to make it look like that. So image, entry, and I want to make it interactive. I want the other players to contribute to that chronicle, uh, chronicalization. And I don't know how to do that yet, but you were talking about hyperlinks and stuff like that earlier. I mean, Obsidian um, Portal sounds like it's actually well equipped to do that kind of it, thing. It might be, and I just haven't found the uh, you know the silver bullet on how to how to make this thing. Uh, it's just for work. me, like as a player, it would be. I, I'm gonna sound really lazy. I promise everyone at home, I'm not lazy. But like I, when I leave the table, I kind of don't want to do any more D and D stuff. Mm-hmm. Until I get to the table. It's emotionally again. draining at the end of a five hour session and yeah. six pack a piece. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe for you guys. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I just, if a lot of times it feels like homework. And that's honestly a big hurdle for me. Sure. Being a DM is doing the homework, mm-hmm. doing the non, I, that's something for me to get over, I think. Yeah. But I think there's probably also a lot of other players who have a similar vibe and, so I guess what I'm trying to say is couching that, that that's an awesome idea. And the way you make it happen is get couching it in a way that gets everyone to the table. Mm-hmm. Like basically make it as accessible as possible for everyone, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, I don't know. I'm trying I to say yes agree, and, and. And I have no, no. idea yeah. how to make that happen. So yeah. uh, that's why it's a resolution. I yeah, resolved totally. to give it a shot. Yeah. And that's probably going to be one of the first to fail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you don't create a system for it to happen, it exactly. won't happen. Yeah. So maybe we yeah. need what, what maybe what we need is a system, something outside of Discord. Mm-hmm. Because Discord's cool, but things get buried and lost in time. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe I don't know. Maybe there's maybe create a Discord chat and then uh everyone can just throw their ideas into it and then once a week you go in and transcribe. We can do a yes uh yes and exercise involving what happened the week before. Okay. Absolutely. And then yeah. transcribe, like, and then create notes of that yes and experience mm-hmm. and distill them into um, uh, a post on an Obsidian portal or a yeah. post yeah, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's from accessible. the voice of a particular PC or something. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. See, that's an idea I didn't have before we started rolling yeah. tape. Sweet. Do you guys still call it that these days? Rolling nope. tape? There's no tape. It's a no. card. Have you ever seen tape being rolled? I actually have. Might a- be before your time. No. No? I recorded on tape. Oh, nice. Actually, okay. uh, when I first got into filmmaking in uh, middle school, mm-hmm. uh, we still had camcorders that were, that were um, recorded on mini eight tracks. They were mm-hmm. like little mini super, they were like as close to digital tape as you could get at the time because uh-huh. it didn't actually record images. It recorded data on tape. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I, I shot on tape for, nice. I don't know, two or three years before we moved to cards. Yeah, yeah, I tried to hunt down my dinner once with a club, so I also like to <laughs> try to do things the way my ancestors yeah. did before me. Um, so, um, degrees of success. 
I only have two left, so you, you got me beat. Uh, how about like. I do two back to back? You totally. do one, and then we'll eventually map Sweet. out. We're running near the end of our time anyway. So. Oh, good. And you guys are probably tired of us by now. Probably so. retention. Let's is- move on to I want to present my GM with a short, mid, and long term character player goal. There's a couple of reasons why I want to do this. I can't tell if you're nodding in agreement or if you're like, not this crap again. No, no, I want this. <laughs> I want this. I, okay. I, all right. I love that idea. As your DM, I love mm-hmm. that idea. <clears throat> My problem is not your idea. It's, um, it's hard for me. Your execution? My execution. Yeah. yeah. Like, from, that's totally fair. It's not even so much my execution as it is my organization. Like, Mm -hmm. I almost want a whiteboard. I want, like, a digital whiteboard where I can, like, put, like, have, like, a little square for Gabby. Have a little square for you. Mm -hmm. Have a little square for everyone else. And have, like, the the short-term, the long-term, and the uh, medium-term goals. Mm -hmm. Like, kind of, and then draw lines and... Red threads going all over the place. And you can be, like, that guy on the meme. Yeah, I want to have a digital version of that that helps me organize those thoughts, basically. Because I've tried doing... I literally, I literally have a spreadsheet right now. Not a spreadsheet, but a Google document with your short-term, those goals written down. Oh, cool. But I don't access it a lot. I don't mm-hmm. think about it a lot because maybe Even when you're prepping for future sessions. Yeah. That, that's when I bust them out for that's your guys' characters. I, and, and honestly, it's probably like I need to create habits and systems for prepping for sessions. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it boils down to. Yeah. But I think updating them and making them always present to your DM, like mm-hmm. not, not only just not only not only telling your DM, this is what I want right now, but every session being like, hey, by the way, just a reminder, these are my goals. Hey, by the way, oh, this, or maybe, hey, this short-term goal has evolved into this new thing because I kind of accomplished half of it. But th- that's but a total session zero it. conversation too, because yeah. like I wouldn't do that as a player yeah. just out of nowhere. Yeah. Hey, how about me? Hey, how about me? Yeah. Hey, how about me? I, I don't want to be that guy and nobody does, right? Mm. But uh, but yeah, some sort of a functional understanding on how to transfer that information. Yeah. Because it's important. It's valuable. Number one, it validates the uh, the the player um, and the player's character. It helps that character to, uh, you know, have a place in the story. I, I don't want to get to the end of this year coming up and realize that I could have been playing Papa Smurf in your game. And your game would have ended the exact same way. And I, I want to believe that character agency means something. And yeah. it's not just a bunch of words that we say as, uh, as gamers. Mm-hmm. Character agency needs to result in actions that alter the trajectory of the story and influence it for better or for worse. Oftentimes for worse. But, um, but I, I need to be able to feel that, you know, Miss Prudence Fairweather call at the end of the, uh, you know, 20 levels or how, whatever we're getting to. I, I can look back as a player and go... I influenced a lot of that. Mm. That that just couldn't have happened if I was playing Papa Smurf or Scooby Doo yeah. or some other character. This runs into an idea of DMs writing stories that their players experience. This this actually kind of butts into that that whole discussion around uh, railroaded stories where the players are experiencing like a theme park as a story mm-hmm. versus player driven stories where the DM and the story is reactive to it. Yeah. And I think a lot of us want to make more reactive stories, but end up creating railroaded stories. And I think that could probably be its own podcast or episode. Yeah, exactly. I also think the reason why uh, that happens is because GMs don't understand the player's characters, uh, motivations, what the hell they're there for. And oftentimes, more often than not, unfortunately, I think that's because the players themselves don't understand their characters until they played them for a bunch of months. Yeah. It's almost like we need a tool to give players to... Help them to, to create a, a character. I'm sure this already exists. I love how we've said that like nine times. <laughs> um, but it would be cool to have like a tool that helps you make a background, like a, like the deep background system in the DMG yeah. and stuff like that. That was actually my example for this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So like, if the if your player doesn't understand their own character and have all that stuff defined, then mm-hmm. the DM can never begin to understand that. And all they can do is give things to their character that their character just yeah. discovered. The player if, discovers about their character. And if you're character. a GM like me. And I'm looking at you yeah. and you don't know who your character is. Yeah. I'm going to start writing your character for you. Exactly. And some players love that. And some do. Yeah. 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 I love that. And that's definitely a session zero question. I try to ask every time now on a scale of one to a hundred where, how comfortable are you with me? Take not taking over the agency of your character, 
but having room to create your character with Absolutely. you and alongside you and Absolutely. behind you. Yeah, I, I, I love own. reveals. I love reveals, and it that does. means I got to write for you. Yeah, sometimes. Absolutely. So um, that's that. Did you say you had two more? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, my last one really is about the podcast. Mm-hmm. I want to make four big pieces of content for the Pathfinder Second Edition community in 2023. Are you talking about like adventures and? No, I'm talking about tools that players and GMs can use in that we're going to make videos around. Okay. The first one. That we've already talked about. And you guys have heard me talk about. I'm learning this alongside with you guys right Um, now. So I want to make a video called Every Class in 30 Minutes. Yes. And I think that's going to be my first big project. Because that is way bigger of a project than I realize. Every time I go to work on it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Chunky boy. I want to make, not only do I want to make a video for it, but I want to make a printout for it. Or like some sort of other component for you to download. Right, something they can take home and look at. The second piece of content I have in my mind that that has a video component, obviously, but also a physical component, something you can take home, is a class selection flowchart. So I want to make I want to make a flowchart to help people, especially new players, choose the class that they want to play. Help them figure out which class is right for them. So at the beginning, it'll just be, literally be. Do you want to mainly cast spells or do you want to mainly you uh, fight sure. with physical stuff? Yeah. And then from there, it'll split off to like, you know, what kind of vibe do you have going on? Yeah. And then when you get to the class, mm-hmm. even at, I want to, I want it to be fairly granular. So at the class level, it'll break off and be like, do you want to be a arcane themed barbarian? Do you want to be a natural barbarian? Right. Do you want to be three to five examples of each or exactly. something? And sure. then give them a character sheet. Or give them even better a path a path builder file that they can download, mm-hmm. load up, and it's pre built for them. And then they can go in and change out all the skill feats that they want to do. That does sound. They can go rad. in and change exact. Wasn't that so fucking cool? That's yeah. so. That's the sort of thing I'd like to see in a session zero. Exactly. Yeah. So I would love to be able to give that to community. I think it'd be. I think it would help a lot of new players mm-hmm. um, get their feet wet. Um, God, and, that would help me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a new player. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I'd use that for every game. So the third one, I haven't figured out the fourth one. I think okay. maybe today has kind of created a bunch of ideas, but the fourth one I want to do every, I, okay. Every country in Galorian, I want to make a video where we describe not in a super meme fashion, but you know, maybe open with a meme of the country mm-hmm. and then, and, and, but I want to, I want to one video that describes and, and glasses over the entirety of the inner sea. Okay. And covers every Is country. there a guy that already does that sort of thing? Maybe. Well, we'll do it too and it'll be better. I'll, I'll look it up and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I think, you know, we're in a new edition. Yeah. So I'd like and to see I want to do it in my style. So what I want to do is have like a Mimi kind of fun tagline for it. Mm-hmm. And then I want to describe very specific things like what's the city? What's the level of the city? What's the influence in the city of that area or the sure. influence of the country? Mm-hmm. And what adventure paths? that are written for Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition take place in that city. Content that already exists. Yeah. That way, and, and like obviously the Wikipedia exists. Sure, And yeah. you can look yeah. it up. Uh-huh. But to have it all in a video and to have it all in a long form piece of content for, mm-hmm. for a DM to be like, I want this to take, I, I, oh, this country looks cool. I want to, you know, um, I want a game that revolves around this country or I want a game that enters this country. Mm-hmm. You can look at that country's entry and see, excuse me, you can look at that country's entry and see what adventure paths sure. enter that country or stay in that country or yeah. are in that area or something like that. I have been reading so much on Pathfinder this past year that I know I've come across different versions of what you're talking about, yeah. but I haven't, I don't think I've seen it all in under one. I want to uh, collate all item. of that information. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, new additions cause for new tools, cause for new, uh, you know, regroupings of old information plus new information and even better i've Mm -hmm. seen this in a couple places i would love for it to be like a digital online resource where you could like where you could like hover over with your cursor hover over the country click on it and then like it'll pop out and then come up to the side and then a detail thing will come down and be like this is what this that would be rad yeah and then we'll have like links to Uh all of the all of the Wikipedia articles yeah, and like and a rogues like gallery. Yeah. Like a reference sheet, you know, mm-hmm. like we do in, in academia, how we have mm-hmm. references and stuff like that. We could do that. 
and reference the Wikipedia or reference. Yeah, some we models. need to meet some coders. Do they have any coders in Portland, Robert? Uh, nah, I don't think so. No, they're okay. pretty luddite out here, actually. Okay. If you think yeah, about it. yeah, no, yeah. no tech in Portland country. Mm, no, uh, I dig it, and I'm ready for it. Sweet. So uh, when we talk to one of our four thousand coder friends, we, we <laughs> might be able to make this happen. All right, I last want, one. Uh, oh God, I got to pick one of two pick then. One, pick um, one. Pick one. They're both so good. Okay, I'm gonna go with this one because it's useful. The other one's just fun. As a player, I want to have index cards with three rounds worth of combat options on them so I don't have to spend the beginning of my turn trying to figure out what the fuck I'm supposed to do. And I don't have to listen to the person to my right figure out their turn trying to figure out what the fuck they're supposed to do. And so on and so forth around the table. Combat is such an excessively long slog, mostly because people just aren't ready when their turn comes around. And I think having index cards with combat options that are specific to different circumstances uh, do I want a, uh, an all out full frontal attack? Um, this is my card for that three rounds worth of that. Do I want a, I'm colossally overpowered and I need to buy time to escape. This index card is about three rounds worth of combat, combat action supporting that. So basically I find the different game states that kind of paint my character into certain corners and then, and then just like have those ready. That way I don't have to spend every single round with all the rest of my fellow players going, Ugh. I'll figure it out when it's my turn. Hey, gotcha. Eric, it's your turn. What's up? Oh, wait. Sorry, I, I don't know. I was on my phone. I just, uh, I'm, I'm tired of that. And it's causing these, uh, these two-hour combat. These combats that, that become two hours, they only needed to be 45 minutes. They don't even have to be that long. They don't even Eric, have to I'm be that long. I'm going to tell you a secret. I, I, I've, I've been trying to keep this from you, so mm-hmm. it, doesn't hurt your, your, it doesn't hurt your sensibilities. Okay. But the last time I played D&D, Pathfinder, was with Oliver. Mm-hmm. And we had four combats in a three hour session. Okay. And there was role play. Pixar it didn't happen. So it happened and we can make it happen in our game too. Okay. I think it just has to Teach do me with, Obi-Wan. Well, I think it has to do with the DM style, obviously. And um the kind of encounters that we give them. Mm-hmm. So like the encounters we had were not, I wouldn't say trivial because we're level one and level two. So mm-hmm. every encounter is like fuck fight for your life. Right. And gremlins and whatnot. Yeah, but they were still interesting. Like the, the existence of combat is fun, even when it's not hard. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of our combats are always set at the, one of the harder difficulties. So mm-hmm. they become really big slogs yeah. where, it, where it matters and you can't make mistakes. But I think if we start designing combats that are a lot easier, like a lot of easier combats, mm-hmm. then like you will have, or less. We'll have much more. We'll have a lot more combat that's fun and fast. I'll, I'll give that a shot. I, I think there. I think there might be something to that. Yeah. Um, and clearly, you guys found a way to make it work on uh, on your Monday game. So, yeah, I'll, I'll log. I'll log that under food for thought. But I think that there's a lot of. I think there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of tables just like ours that mm-hmm. only have one combat a night and have a hard time with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I want an app for that. Yeah. I'm gonna squeeze my last one in. Pick one scene per session to help another player character have a shining moment. Be cool to your fellow peeps. Be cool. Be weird, be but weird. be cool. Stay weird, goblins. Thanks so much for checking out our podcast today. Yeah.